Good morning and welcome to another live CNAS event. Today we are pleased to host a virtual launch event for our new report, Strengthening the Shield, Japan's Defense Transformation and the US-Japan Alliance. Uh, my name is Joshua Fitt and I'm a, an associate fellow with the Indo-Pacific Security Program here at CNAS. Um, so in late 2022, Japan released three major strategic documents that marked a shift away from Japan's uh, defense and security strategies of the past several decades in a few important ways, such as targeting 2% of uh, GDP for national security spending, uh, acquiring counter-strike capabilities, and other updates to how it views its force posture and readiness challenges. Um, these changes are part of an evolution geared towards Japan uh, becoming more capable of its own self-defense, um, more capable as an ally to the United States and a stronger pillar of stability in the Indo-Pacific region. So as we discuss in uh, the report that um, we released this morning, uh, we believe that these changes will have profound implications for the trajectory of the Alliance in the coming decades. In the report, we cover Tokyo's motivations for the shift, related changes in force posture, policy and capabilities, Japan's relationships with regional and European security partners, and of course, the US-Japan alliance. Um, all these changes, uh, you know, whenever there are big changes, there will always be implementation challenges. Uh, so we, we uh, were mindful of those as well and proposed a, a few ways going forward to how to mitigate the effects of those. So uh, today we are very lucky to have a fantastic panel assembled um, to discuss these matters. So first we have uh, Jimbo Ken, who is Managing Director at the International House of Japan and President of the Asia Pacific Initiative. We have Yuki Tatsumi, who is Senior Fellow and Co-Director of the East Asia Program and Director of the Japan Program at the Stimson Center. Zach Cooper, who is Senior Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. And Jacob Stokes, who is a Senior Fellow with the Indo-Pacific Security Program at CNAS and one of the report's co-authors. So I'm ex uh, exceedingly grateful that you could all join us this morning. Um, I'm particularly grateful to Ken, who is joining us from New Zealand, where it is currently one in the morning. Um, uh, so shout out to Red Bull. Um, but uh, anyway, so we're doing this event live so that we can incorporate the audience's questions. So if you're watching this from home, whether it's on Twitter or on the CNAS website, wherever you're watching, um, please do feel free to uh, make your voice heard and, and send us your questions for the panel. Um, you can use the chat box uh, below the video if you're on the CNAS website, or you can tweet with the hashtag CNAS2023. Um, and uh, we'd love to, to get you involved in this conversation as well. So uh, with that, I'd like to, to start the panel going here. Um, and uh, Ken, if it's all right, I, I'd start with you. So in December 2022, as I mentioned, Tokyo released these three major strategic documents, the National Security Strategy, the National Defense Strategy, and the Defense Buildup Program. So um, in your view, what are the most consequential changes uh, stemming from these documents, and how unprecedented are these changes, really? Sure. Uh, th thank you uh, very much for the, your invitation. And as you mentioned, the three strategic document that we adopted last December, uh, which has a hundred, nearly 130 pages uh, in total, uh, which comprise the basic direction of our defense and security strategy in, in a comprehensive uh, manner. But the baseline of what we are going to address is that the, based on our emerging uh, recognition that Japan faces a security environment that is the most severe uh, since the end of World War II, uh, we have China, North Korea, and the uh, reassertive Russia simultaneously. And Japan decided to take a number uh, of uh, historic decisions, uh, as you uh, already mentioned. Most notably, we, we have decided to double the size of the de defense budget by 2027, uh, aiming at achieving the expenditure level at the 2% uh, of uh, Japan's uh, GDP. And that enable uh, what we try to, uh, you know, achieve the fundamental reinforcement uh, of the self-defense uh, force, and that involved the some of those uh, unconventional uh, uh, weapon system that involves the uh, you mentioned counter-strike capability or the long-range long strike capability, 
comparing to uh, our uh, pretty much low key uh, defense posture uh, that we maintain for the past decades under the concept of the exclusively defense oriented defense, uh, I think that our concept of the geographical expansion of how we engage the adversary uh, in the early stage at FAR is something that the Japanese uh, defense concept uh, is uh, aiming at. And remaining are, you, you can you know, name a few, including uh, you know, uh, expanded uh, missile defense uh, capabilities, more sustainably, uh, sustainability of the forces uh, to achieve the resiliency uh, of dealing with it. And if the deterrence uh, you know, fails, uh, definitely we really have to uh, achieve the asymmetrical uh, superiority by uh, you know, uh, incorporating our cross-domain uh, capability to deal uh, with the potential uh, adversaries. So these are the baselines of what we have uh, achieved so far. And definitely this is the historic change uh, that we are uh, experiencing. Excellent, thank you. Um, Yuki, I'd like to ask you a follow-up question here. So whether it's provocations from North Korea, coercion from China, or um, the specter of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, uh, the increasingly severe security environment in Northeast Asia has played an important role in changing the politics of the security policy in Japan. Um, so to what extent is the security environment alone driving those changes, or uh, are there other factors that have also enabled these shifts? Um, and do you see a difference in, in those potential factors at the uh, strategist and policymaker level versus the general public? Great. Thanks for the question, Josh. And um, before I start, thanks uh, again, CNAS, for uh, giving me this opportunity to join the panel with uh, amongst friends. Um, I'm looking forward to the discussion as well. So in, in response to your question, Josh, I think one thing that I would say is um, external threat is very, very big, both on the minds of policymakers and on the, Jap um, on the public writ large. Uh, that enabled these uh, changes that the Ken just uh, nicely laid out. It worked in a different way. But it was very, in, in the eyes of the public, um, the visual of the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine was very dramatic and very, very, um, I guess, vivid uh, reminder that uh, even in the uh, era of like 2023, um, these kind of, you know, invasion by a one powerful sovereign nation against the other, you know, weaker or smaller sovereign nation can happen. Um, and that was a stark reminder. I think that really kind of brought this do dashed in like a, a dose of a sense of reality in the uh, public's mind when it comes to the threat uh, that the Japanese government keeps talking about. And then that is really aggravated um, later on by the uh, increasing aggressiveness by PRC toward the Taiwan, uh, particularly um particularly post uh, then Speaker Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, when PRC launched that big uh, joint exercise basically encircling Taiwan, island of Taiwan, that really um, brought home the, uh, the uh, aggravating uh, threat environment, security environment that Japan is in. And that actually uh, did a did couple of things. So on the policymakers level, I see those kind of external threats became a real driver behind um, the policymaker to start really actualizing and think through more concretely about how to, you know, quote unquote, fundamentally reinforce uh, defense capability that the prime minister should, uh, you know, set out. And uh, that you know, basically materialized in a way that uh, you can see in a defense strategy and also defense build up plan. And that include a couple of the very, um, what, what, what probably would have been inconceivable just five years ago that indefinitely included um, counter-strike capabilities. And uh, because of this uh, kind of a sense of realization that, that this uh, threat discussion is really real in the, minds of, um, in the minds of Japanese public, that really created the enabling political environment when Japanese government really tried to uh, put, this, uh, put this plan together. And uh, many of the defense uh, officials that I spoke to in Tokyo after that uh, stra three strategic document came coming out is that they really anticipated a big pushback from the public, especially on those uh, conscious right capabilities and other more of a, you know, politically sensitive um, items. And they were actually surprised that there really was almost no pushback. And uh, that really uh, demonstrates the um, 
evolving uh, threat perception on the minds of Japanese public as well. Very interesting shift in dynamics as always. Uh, thank you for the explanation. Um, relatedly, Zach, uh, I was wondering if I could ask you about uh, the Camp David summit. So one of the outcomes of the recent US-Japan ROK summit uh, at uh, Camp David was, uh, and I quote, a mutual commitment to consult with each other in an expeditious manner to coordinate our regional responses, excuse me, responses to regional challenges, provocations, and threats that affect our collective interests and security. So what does that mean in practice? Um, and how does this trilateral commitment to consult affect the, the US-Japan bilateral relationship? That's a great question. And first, Josh, uh, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. I'm sorry that I sound a little bit like Darth Vader. It's too much <laughs> yelling at children. Uh, but but great to be with you and, and really a wonderful report. Um, I, I think the Camp David summit was a major breakthrough in, in a couple of different ways, but most importantly, because it demonstrated that the US, South Korea and Japan can move past some of the historical issues and really try and think about what it would mean to institutionalize their relationship. Now, the there are some big pieces to this, right? Having a yearly meeting, I think, is, is beneficial. It will make it harder, for example, for any of the three sides to cancel the trilateral arrangement. Um, but I think you've pointed to the, the major innovation here, which is this language about this commitment to consult. What does that mean exactly? I think we'll have to see. Let's be honest, if you read most US security treaties, there is a commitment to consult in all of them. Uh, and yet what that really means in each of the treaties is also unclear, right? There are different requirements for consultation. There are different requirements for action in each of the treaties. But at the end of the day, this is really up to political leaders. So my view is that the commitment to consult is uh, about two things. One, it's about showing that this, these three countries, which you know, do share really similar concerns about North Korea, about Russia, about China, are increasingly working together. But it's also a signal, I think, um, to those three, to Beijing and Moscow and Pyongyang, that the more that they work together, and of course, right now, we're seeing Kim Jong-un and Vladimir Putin uh, meet just today, uh, that this is going to drive greater trilateral cooperation. But exactly what form that will take, I still don't think that's clear. Um, I don't think we're going to see, of course, anything like an actual trilateral alliance. So this commitment to consult may be sort of the high watermark in the near term. But the institutionalization we're seeing of the trilateral relationship, I, I think, is quite substantial. Absolutely. Certainly uh, a groundbreaking achievement. It just to get all three leaders in the same spot is uh, really symbolic and and. Uh, a great progress in my view. Um, Jake, I want to bring you into the conversation, but very quickly first, uh, Ken or Yuki, do you have any insights for us on uh, how the summit was received in Japan? Oh, well, first of all, uh, I think it was a important uh, connecting dots uh, moment for a trilateral relationship. Uh, historically, uh, that the US-Japan, US-Korea, both alliances are formed in a, pretty much in a different uh, manner. Uh, so the uh, C4I command and control system of the, you know, how, how they operate it, how they consult with each other, how they're very different uh, types of the mechanisms. Uh, Koreans are more integrated, and I think US-Japan's are more parallel. Uh, but uh, well, we, if we look at the consequences, what 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 uh, you know is happening uh, in Northeast Asia, uh, there are no luxury that uh, we cannot really separate, detach our two two of our uh, you know alliances uh, alone, and definitely for for uh, you know each of our perspective, we share the same theater uh, that requires the uh, uh, the higher jointness in dealing with them. So one of the missing piece that uh, you know we we had uh, obviously was the Japan Korea relationship. But uh, thanks to the new government uh, in Korea, with a courageous decision made by the President uh, Yoon Suk Yeol uh, to solve uh, uh, their own problems, uh, and 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 also that uh, uh, receptiveness of Japan was uh, quite high uh, in that regard. And I think that uh, we rapidly created our mutual confidence uh, to uh, bringing in those. Uh, uh, you know, moments, uh, 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 modality of meeting with each other. And that created the platform for trilateral to move things forward. So that was, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, quite quite positively received uh, in, in Japan as well. 
I would I would definitely agree with that. And then another thing is, um, yes, uh, President um, President uh, Yoon definitely, um, you know, first cre huge credit goes to him to start re really reaching out with the Ali branches. But then I think equally, it is important to note that uh, his his gesture was reciprocated by Prime Minister Kishida by equally courageous decision on his own, because there were still a lot of uh, conservative voices within Japan about wariness of uh, reciprocating with us such a behavior. But I think what was very powerful was the uh, he invited uh, President Yoon to Hiroshima at the time of the G7 summit, and then two leaders paid respect to the uh, memorial of the uh, uh, Korean victims of the atomic bomb in Hiroshima. I think that really was a, a very powerful visual, even back in the uh, Korea, I believe. And then I think uh, that really created the uh, political atmosphere for this trial act to um, come together. And I think what was another thing that was, I thought was very important coming out of the Camp David was um, by connecting those dots, um, U.S. ROK Alliance always had the uh, focus of uh, primarily, rightly so, on the Korean Peninsula. But I think what that did was, I think it really did set the U.S. ROK Alliance also on the path very similar to U.S. Japan Alliance, which is more regionally oriented, not just by not not just on the peninsula. So realignment of the uh, focus of these uh, two um, two bilateral alliances, I think that was another important aspect that comes out. But obviously, as Ken mentioned, um, what Japan and Korea can bilaterally achieve, especially when it comes to a mill to mill relationship in terms of uh, can they restart, you know, port visits, a mutual port visit? Can they start planning bilateral joint trainings uh, without U.S. to start, you know, lining up those things? I think um, those are more of the, uh, I guess, a litmus test, really, at uh, moving forward. Very interesting. Looking forward to seeing what's coming from there. And I'm glad you touched on the the, the leadership forming uh, the political environment. I'd like to touch on that a bit later as well. Um, Jake, uh, considering the defense and security strategy changes that Tokyo outlined, um, as we've been discussing, what are the most important changes to be made on the U.S. side in the alliance equation? Um, what new strategies or policies would maximize the potential of this new era in Japanese thinking? Yeah, well, thanks, Josh. It's great to be here. And thanks to Ken and Yuki, Yuki and Zach uh, for their contributions during the research process uh, in, in here today. Um, of course, you know, the Alliance agenda is extensive. And so the there's areas where improved cooperation could help really across the board, uh, especially given how ambitious Japan's plans have become. Uh, but kind of three top my list. Uh, I think the first is really about deepening planning for contingencies and bolstering extended deterrence. Uh, I think in general, uh, for both the because of both the changes that Japan is implementing, but also just the nature of the security environment, uh, contingency planning needs to become much more specific and uh, in, in detailed in an alliance context, especially if there's any kind of um, ambition to spread that out to the trilateral with South Korea later on. You know, so in the report uh, on the extended deterrence piece, we call for uh, the U.S.-Japan extended deterrence dialogue to actually be upgraded to the assistant secretary level in line with the, the new, relatively new uh, U.S. Republic of Korea nuclear consultative group. Um, I think that would be uh, reflective of, of where those issues stand uh, today, but also raise, uh, you know, structural possibilities later on for more integrated uh, deterrence planning with South Korea further down the road. I don't think we're there uh, politically uh, yet. So that's the first big area. I think second would really be about expanding the agenda for military technology sharing, co-development and co-production. You know, here we can take a step back and see that the military uh, technological landscape uh, is changing quite quickly. Uh, and both allies have really put technology near the top of their uh, defense buildup agendas. But we don't really have the, the resources to waste with overlapping R&D efforts, and we need to build in interoperability from the outset. So really, the rationales for deepening cooperation on military technologies are quite strong. Uh, there are some narrow efforts underway on things like counter hypersonics, uh, but going much deeper will require Im further improvements to Japan's information security and security clearance regimes. And I think there needs to be kind of a, a, a carrot or a, a benefit that Japan would get for that uh, to help uh, move those uh you know, reforms uh, along. So in the report, we called for creating a roadmap for expanding defense technology, uh, 
cooperation concurrently with Japan's implementation of specific improvements to its information security practices uh, in infrastructure. And I think we also need some realism about the standards here. It's not, you know, the U.S. defense industrial base and, and uh, is not itself impenetrable. And so, you know, we, we need to have a standard that's possible for, for Japan to meet uh, and balance the risk of, of, you know, sharing technology with the benefit of a more capable ally. Um, and here again, we can look at um, integrating Japan uh, into pillar two of the AUKUS agreement um, as it matures, uh, which is the, the pillar that's more focused on advanced capabilities. Um, third and finally, uh, in terms of overarching areas, I think improving force posture and resilience through things like hardening aircraft shelters, bu boosting munition stocks, that's really a near term imperative. I think this stuff is not as glamorous as buying new ships and aircraft, but arguably it's just as if not even more uh, essential to deterrence. Because if we do it right, it means that ch uh, China's ability to conduct debilitating missile strikes early in a contingency or a conflict is reduced. And therefore, at least in theory, Beijing should be less confident in its ability to win in a short, sharp, fait accompli style campaign. Um, and that's really a decision calculus we, we want to be shaping. You know, one thing I learned from my time in government uh, is that it's easy to kind of release a strategy um, and, and a plan, uh, but effective implementation uh, is much, much harder. Um, I think in general, the plans are there on paper, certainly, certainly in Japan, increasingly in the United States. But can we implement them and can we implement them fast enough to keep up with the regional security environment? I think that's kind of the real question. Uh, in the report, we called for standing up an alliance readiness, resilience and posture task force that's not focused on necessarily new plans, but is really laser focused on coordinated implementation uh, in these areas. So I think overall, in terms of implementing from the U.S. side um, in, in helping foster uh, these changes for Japan, those are the big areas that I see. Thanks for that excellent rundown, Jake. Uh, certainly lots to do on both sides of this, um, but all heading towards a really positive direction. Um, before we move on, I'd like to actually uh, address the, the uh, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the information security aspect of this. Um, I think it's a really critical piece of enabling further uh, cooperation. So I'm wondering if um, Ken or Yuki, either of you would like to give a bit of a background on sort of the, the, the discussion there within Japan. Well, it's been uh, the sensitive issue for uh, so many years uh, in the U.S.-Japan uh, alliance. Uh, since there has been the uh, accumulated uh, frustration among the Washington uh, colleagues about the the lack of uh, uh, you know legal basis uh, of dealing with uh, information security uh, in Japan, which uh, we have uh, like a much more stovepipe type of the uh, regulations uh, among those. Uh, uh, the defense ministry, self-defense force, defense industrial basis, and others. But uh, what about the overarching uh, type of the security clearance, which can be co uh, conducive uh, to the international standards, uh, to be uh, compatible with uh, many of those uh, uh, Western nations NATO uh, have adopted? Japan has not been uh, having a security ISA standards, uh, which is the, uh, I think, uh, you know, putting those... Uh, uh, our defense industries uh, as a start line of uh, competition. Uh, whenever that the uh, public procurement process uh, starts, uh, you have to uh, set on the bid by having ISA standards, which Japan does not really have it. So in terms of uh, having a higher level of uh, you know uh, interoperability and joint operation with the United States, and then joining in the higher level of the industrial defense industry cooperation, Japan definitely need a higher level of the security clearance. So which is the debate that is underway under the Kishida uh, administration? And uh, on, on the industrial uh, side that uh, Minister Takaichi uh, is now appointed uh, to uh, set forward those uh, debates to move, move things forward, to legalize uh, the issues. And uh, after the cabinet's uh, reshuffle that took place uh, just today, uh, Takaichi-san uh, remained to be the minister and responsible for that. So we, we do have a high hope that this uh, the, the debate will progress uh, in the coming months and uh, hope that, that that will lead us uh, to bring about the better condition for the deeper collaboration with the United States. Thank you. Uh, before we move on, I'd just like to remind our audience, uh, if you're watching this live, uh, please do feel free to send us your questions. 
Uh, we're really interested in hearing from you, and it's a great opportunity to ask the, the panel we've assembled here um, anything related to the U.S.-Japan alliance and the issues we're discussing today. Um, you can do that, as the, the banner says, using the chat box on our website. Um, or if you're streaming from a different platform like Twitter, feel free to tweet with the hashtag CNAS2023, um, and we'll do our best to answer your questions. Um, and I'm happy to intersperse them now. We don't have to wait till the end to, to hear from you. So feel free to dump in whenever you're ready. Um, Ken, I'm glad you raised this point about uh, the cabinet reshuffle. It's late breaking news out of Tokyo. Um, Yuki, would you mind uh, walking us through sort of the, the big updates from our perspective uh, related to the, the defense and security aspects that we're talking about today? Um, what can we expect from Kihara-san as the defense minister and Kamikawa-san as the foreign minister. So um, thank you, Josh, for that question. So this uh, cabinet reshuffle was kind of an interesting reshuffle. Um, and to me, I'm not, I'm still kind of scratching my head and get my you know, heads around on some of those appointments. And uh, Kamikawa-san um, Kamikawa um, succeeding a Mr. Minister Hayashi as a foreign minister is one of the big ones mm -hmm. because I thought, um, you know, Mr. Hayashi basically shares the same um, outlook when it comes to foreign and security policy with Prime Minister Kishida. But, um, you know, he can have the soft face uh, even when he delivers a tough message. So I thought that really helped to, you know, take off edges, especially when Japan still had to um, figure out how to explore this, uh, its uh, own relationship with uh, Beijing. As um, as uh, antagonistic as it become, um, China is still a, a big uh, um, regional partner, at least for Japan, when it comes to trade and economies. And uh, recently, there were some developments between Japan, China, and Korea um, on that front as well. So, you know, um, swapping him out at this juncture was a little bit interesting um, timing, I thought. And um, and then I think same thing with uh, uh, Kihara Sensei. Um, you know, defense Min ministry is not new to him, so. Um, that probably is a plus that uh, you know, um, to get a kind of a new um, new face um, going in, and uh, he is already familiar with the issue set that uh, ministry has been grappling with. So that speaks to me as more of a continuity of the uh, planning and implementation of the uh, this uh, build up plans and a uh, strategy moving forward. So. Overall, but then I, what I do question is um, usually when cabinet uh, reshuffle happens, prime minister really tries to prop up his uh, support rating. And I'm not quite sure how helpful this uh, particular reshuffle would be. Um, Ken is usually in country. He probably has better sense than I do. But my sense is um, I, don't, I don't think it will be a huge uh, prop up of the uh, domestic approval rating of him. Um, so that could question um, Prime Minister Kishida's uh, political ability to move some of those ball, uh, balls uh, forward um, on some of the issues that we have been discussing this morning. Very interesting. Uh, would anyone else like to jump in on the cabinet or we could move on? Cool. Uh, so Zach, uh, you recently published a piece in War on the Rocks with Chris Johnstone where you mentioned that the U.S. Forces Japan headquarters has essentially no operational role in the alliance. Um, you know, why is it important for strategists to rethink this arrangement in light of Japan's growing operational role within the alliance? What are the things that would be possible if what you describe were to be implemented? It's you know it's a really interesting question because you do a really nice job in the report of talking about two different things, hardware and software in the alliance. But I think if you if you read the press, what you usually will see talked about about Japanese defense uh, reforms is a lot of hardware focus, right? It's about how much money is being spent. It's about how many missiles are being procured and on what timeline. And part of the reason is it's easy to measure these things, right? So if you're a reporter and you're looking for data and you want to explain to people that don't know much about the U.S.-Japan alliance that Japan is really stepping up, you can point to specific data points if you talk about hardware. I think the problem is that, as we know, and we're watching this happen in Ukraine, what matters so often isn't so much just hardware, it's also software, right? 
how do you actually operate? How do you use the hardware you have most effectively? And so the good news from a US-Japan standpoint is that the alliance is very close and we have a long history of working together. The bad news is that we don't really have the wartime structures that we have with some of our other allies because frankly, the US-Japan alliance hasn't been a wartime alliance, right? Uh, it came out of wartime, but not in the same way that say the US-Korea alliance came out, right? Where you have a combined force, uh, combined forces command, CFC, uh, which actually is a combined command. If the US and Japan were to get into a major contingency today, we would be fighting from two separate command structures. Um, the US would be leading probably from the Indo-Pacific Command in Hawaii. Japan would be leading probably uh, from the Joint Staff Office right now, but in the future from what will be the new permanent joint headquarters, which is going to be based at the Defense Ministry in Ichigaya. So that is really challenging, right? And ideally, we would want both the United States and Japan, if not to have a combined command structure, because I, I realize there are political and legal challenges that would be serious in both countries with that structure, at least to have a co-located command. Of course, that's difficult because we don't have an obvious place to co-locate command. And so part of what Chris Johnstone and I have been pushing for is to accelerate these discussions, right? We, we talk a lot about timelines and about China's uh, increasing development of capabilities that are real challenges for Japan and the United States. Well, I, I think we need to be moving much faster, not just on the hardware side, but on the software side. And, and here we should give credit where it's due. I think Prime Minister Kishida and uh, of course, Joe Biden have, have been pressing forward with a lot of software updates to the US-Japan alliance. But if I had one area where I would want to see more focus, it would be this command and control issue. We need to have a structure in Japan, which is co-located where, uh, where the two militaries can really work closely together in a high-end contingency. And, and right now we just don't have that. Yuki, would you like to, to add something? Yeah, so um, Zach raised all these uh, important points um, about software and uh, people. So what I am also um, worried about is uh, this all these uh, new um, stand, you know, stand on um, standing for the PGA permanent joint headquarters. Those things are all discussed without really um, having a personnel plan to expand the size of the force. Um, there is an argument to be made here. Um, Self-defense force is currently having issue of filling up the current billets. So th they're really not quite ready to start expanding it, but that becomes an issue if they keep expanding, you know, different, adding di different organizations and enhancing. And they already started talking about um, their cyber defense and expansion of that capability. So they're basically moving people around within the current personnel size. And at some point, there needs to be a discussion within Japan about is this is that sustainable approach. So I would just uh, throw that out um, as an additional thing that I would very much like to start really being discussed um, as moving forward. Absolutely. Jake, I, I know this, uh, this came up a bit in our report, uh, research for our report. Wondering if you could talk a bit about one of the ideas floated um, in how to address the personnel challenges being uncrewed or AI systems. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Josh. I, I think, uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, challenges associated with this. And, you know, it's, it's one thing to hit your overall uh, recruiting targets for for the general force, um, but to get the uh, type of highly technologically proficient um, force uh, that some of these more sophisticated capabilities require, whether it's cyber or emerging capabilities like AI, uh, as we've seen in the United States, at least in others, is kind of many times harder. Uh, and you really have to, to rethink uh, not only the training from the entry levels, but also uh, uh, you know, unconventional ideas for bringing folks into the force, including civilians you know, from the private sector or other types of arrangements. Um, and so uh, you know, I think part of the software uh, Zach was talking about is also the people. Um, and so 
you know, one of the things we uh, referenced in the report was uh, more uh, joint consultation uh, about personnel issues, whether that's integrating women into the forces, uh, attracting young people, um, but also uh, recruiting and retaining uh, and training a, a more technologically sophisticated um, force are all going to be really, really tough challenges. Uh, in addition, there's just this question on uncrewed systems or what we often call drones. You know, there are many forms of them, but there's kind of an implicit assumption there that you kind of go, you know, one drone, you can re you can reduce your force one human, but a lot of our human operator, but a lot of our experience so far has been that the operational backbone um, for uncrewed systems means is actually larger than it would be for a crude system. Uh, so there are a lot of arcane technical details like that, um, that, that end up being really important as you put these plans uh, into practice. And those are problems that are going to have to be solved um, if the, the, you know, ambitions laid out in these documents is to come to fruition. And, and, you know, that's true for Japan. It's, it's true for the United States as well. Excellent. Well, uh, we've gotten some questions from the audience, and so I'd like to, to introduce one of those. Um, this question we have from Rachel. Rachel, thank you so much for the question and for participating. Really appreciate it. Um, the question is, how do you see the upcoming U.S. election potentially harming or boosting the U.S.-Japan alliance? Will the alliance uh, weather fluctuating domestic politics in either the U.S. or Japan? Um, Zach, I would love to, to hear your thoughts on this question. Yeah, of course. I, I think this is a really critical question. And in the next year, I bet we're going to talk more and more about it, right? Because Japan had a secret weapon uh, four years ago, and his name was Prime Minister Abe. Um, obviously, Prime Minister Abe, unfortunately, is not here anymore. And the reality is, if we have Joe Biden being reelected, I, I don't think there are going to be a lot of concerns about the U.S.-Japan alliance. But if Donald Trump is elected, there are going to be big questions, right? And, and part of the reason is Japan came out, actually, of the Trump administration looking pretty good. Uh, it was maybe the only major U.S. treaty ally who you could say didn't have a real uh, stumble during the Trump administration with the United States. And a lot of that, of course, was because of Prime Minister Abe. So I think the question is twofold. One, is there a leader who could build that kind of report with Donald Trump? And, you know, Ken will have more thoughts on this, but I think the answer is probably no. Um, there's not somebody who's obviously going to get along with Donald Trump as well as Prime Minister Abe did. Um, there are people who I, I think could maybe do a fine job of managing him, but it, it will be more challenging. The second part, though, is that the US and Japan have such similar interests in a whole range of areas, right? Security, economics, technology, global governance issues, that I think Washington and Tokyo are being pushed together. So the, the bad news is that if Donald Trump comes back, I, I think the um, underlying challenges will be more severe than they were a few years ago. But the good news is that Japan is so vital to what Washington is trying to do in all kinds of areas that I think the underlying logic of the alliance will, will maintain itself. Now, the question going forward over the next year is, are there things that we should do to institutionalize the alliance against domestic challenges? And, you know, we should be honest that these could also come from Japan, right? And part of what we saw at the trilateral meeting at Camp David was a focus on institutionalization. And let's be clear, that wasn't just about Donald Trump. That was also about the risks of a change in leadership in Korea, for example, right? We, we talked about the courageous leadership of President Yoon, which I think has been vital. Um, we could have a change of leadership in, in Tokyo as well. Uh, so I think at the end of the day, the big focus over the next year will be, are there things we need to do to institutionalize the US-Japan alliance against these political risks? And what I would say is, I think we're actually seeing some of this happen already, right? One way you institutionalize is by setting up uh, meetings that happen on a recurring basis every year, so you don't have to schedule them uh, every time, that they're already locked in, right? We've got Japan and the US in a quad meeting. We've got uh, groups on security and economics that meet, uh, in some cases, twice a year, right? You're talking about upgrading our extended deterrence dialogue. I think that would be valuable. So I actually think in a lot of ways, we've built the um, foundation of the alliance so it's strong against leadership changes. But, but let's be candid, the missing piece of this 
is a prime minister in Japan who could handle a difficult American president. I, I don't think we know who that might be yet. Excellent. I can feel the other panelists through the screen wanting to jump in on this question. So uh, Jake, Yuki, Ken, um, any thoughts on uh, would welcome them. Yeah, very quickly. Um, you're going to see how you're going to see moving forward in the next uh, 18 months or so, how obsessed Japanese are about U.S. presidential election. Um, and, um, you know, people are already like start getting really, really obsessed about it. Um, so what the uh, former President Trump is up to in terms of, you know, all these indictments and all that, they are very, very detailed reported, I think. In Japan. <laughs> but um, I think um, one thing to note is that, you know, we are already kind of talking as if um, Trump too could come back, but then that's still not, you know, locked in, you know, stone. So we can always uh, think about the different scenario. However, though, I think what we should not um, lose a sight on is that even if a Republican, you know, even if we do have a Republican president, let's say in 2024, that is that last name is not Trump. The uh, agenda could be quite similar to the uh, Trump one administration in terms of, you know, basically bottom line is like make America great again and America first approach. And uh, that will be very challenging for Japan as well. I mean, people are now, you know, really focused on who will be the president. But then I think another thing is that who that, you know, the message that actual that person will deliver to allies, I think that will be, um, have a deeper repercussion. So I think um, I tend to agree with that, Zach, that um, maybe we should really, you know, two governments should really start looking at like locking in some of the progress in terms of, you know, in, in the, that the alliance have made. But then also um, safeguarding the uh, Japan side's uh, progress that have been made um, against the, uh, you know, potential uh, political changes. Um, I think a continuity of the government is important in Japan. That's always good. But then I think at this point at the implementation, the uh, prime minister's political capital to basically, you know, if necessary, bulldoze and implement some of those challenging items is becoming increasingly important. So what if we are not lucky enough to have that kind of leaders around when really hard part comes up, like, you know, over the next three years or so? Um, that probably is something that uh, I guess, um, you know, it, it, it ought to be like thought, thought through probably from now. Really interesting. I, I was in Japan in the summer of 2016, and I remember watching the live uh, NHK Japanese coverage uh, of the RNC, and that was uh, quite quite something to see all the different um, <laughs> excellent charts and graphs and graphics, and uh, the detail was really impressive. So, uh, Jake, uh, any any thoughts on the, the upcoming election and the effects on the alliance? Sure. Well, of course, we Americans are obsessed with it too, and, and yeah. <laughs> the great uncertainty is 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 there. But um, and and watching it all too closely. But I think um, you know. As it relates to the topic we're discussing here today, it's you know I think one of the interesting questions is to what degree have these changes in in Japan been prompted by the experience of the Trump administration and the the concern uh, about abandonment, right? Um, and I think there's a, a degree to which you could argue that these changes are meant to make Japan more independent and autonomous uh, in its defense capability. But some of the operational uh, elements of it, so for example, on Counter-Strike, even if you have the missiles, you don't necessarily have what's called the kill chain, the satellites and other uh, enabling pieces that help you target um, those types of capabilities. Um, Japan doesn't have its own. And so we'll, to operate a Counter-Strike capability, it'll actually become more reliant on the U.S. than it, than it had been before. And then if we move forward with some of these more combined um, operational structures that we've been discussing, you'll actually see a closer U.S.-Japan alliance. And so on the one hand, Japan is becoming more able to fend for itself, but is also, you know, kind of more entwined in the alliance. So that, I just think that's a really interesting paradox as we tussle with this question of what does a different uh, a change in presidency uh, mean potentially for the U.S.-Japan alliance? Uh, if I may add uh, some uh, alternative view about this. Uh, I, I do share uh, the notion that Zach mentioned about uh, we, we Washington, Tokyo, share the 
wider foundation of the strategic viewpoint with each other and the Jake over the uh, you know it's it's designed as a default that we uh, you know work together uh, as operationally uh, in uh, various types of the of the uh, the scenario that we face. But at the same time, looking back to you know. 2017, 2020, later stage of the uh, you know Abe administration, I think we were uh, quite autonomous uh, in a way to achieve several uh, diplomatic uh, uh, initiatives like uh, CPTPP and also our engagement with China. Prime Minister Abe met with uh, President Putin 27 times in total, and why we were able to do that probably because of the personal confidence by the President Trump to let Abe to take its own uh, engagement policy uh, outside the scope of the U.S.-Japan uh, alliance. And I think something that is going on is diversification of the, you know, the power uh, in, in the world. Global South has been mentioned, which is out, out, of, out of the scope of the Japan-U.S. outreaching, uh, you know, types of the uh, operation that, that is taking place in the other parts of the world. And I think Japan needs to engage proactively on that perspective. And if we do well and then bring back those assets to the alliance, that is even better for the alliance. So I think at this, it's very important to look at the, how much we share with each other. But at the same time, how much we can do outside the alliance to bring back the, those assets to the alliance is something that will make uh, alliance even better. Very interesting. Yeah, um, I, I thank you all for your, your thoughts on this point. Um, I, I think I would just close it out by saying, you know, when we talk about the bilateral relationship or the U.S.-Japan ROK relationship, these are all democracies where the leadership changes. And it's a it's just a fact of our political system. So um in a sense, you know, these changes are inevitable in some time scale. And I think the degree to which we can, as you all mentioned, um, insulate these very important critical aspects of our country's relationships from, um, you know, extreme political change uh, is very worthwhile. Um, Rachel, I would like to thank you for an excellent question. Uh, if you're watching and would like to be like Rachel and submit an audience question, you can Put it in the chat box below if you're watching on the website or tweet at CNAS 2023, uh, the hashtag CNAS 2023. Um, we have another audience question, uh, this time from Margaret. Thank you for the question, Margaret. Um, can you speak more to how the GOJ intends to fund this defense increase and how the public has reacted to these plans? Um, Yuki, if I could start with you. Right, and then... Um... Um, Ken can uh, correct me with the, any kind of a last minute update, you know, up to date uh, changes that, that their uh, plan has been making. So Japan, in essence, tries to fund this uh, defense and national security related expenditure by a combination of a uh, combination of uh, three measures, um, one, w one of which involves uh, tax hikes. That's that's an interesting question that Margaret posed about how, how public is uh, reacting to this. So one of them is tax hike, as you know, as you, um, as I mentioned, uh, of uh, three different types, if I can, if I recall correctly, um, corporate tax, uh, tobacco tax, and uh, I guess I, it was a personal income tax. The other one is the um, they create the fund um, within the government that basically they collect, I think, unspent expenditures expenditures of the government other um, budget items of the government of Japan that will be directed toward, um, that will be directed toward um, supporting, uh, funding these uh, spendings. And the third was, um, I believe, some kind of a bond system that they are thinking about to fund this. So now, they, these are combination creates an interesting public reaction, as you can imagine, because tax hike is never popular. So the more and more um, public polling shows is that uh, public is supportive of the cause of defense expenditure increase, but they really, really do not like they, in fact, they really hate the idea of those funding, you know, funding comes from increasing tax rates. So um, mo more recently, um, ruling party, Liberal Democratic Party's um, tax commission came up with a proposal uh, uh, proposal that maybe some of those tax hikes can be stagger, staggered in the way that they don't all kick in at the same time. And uh, some of them have a delayed effect, um, delayed start date. 
But that also creates this uh, Japanese government's commitment to up the defense expenditure, national security uh, the, um, expenditure to a certain level within five years, right? If the revenue increase that are anticipating are not kicking in until the later, then that could create the uh, complications. So I would just stop at that and see uh, if uh, Ken has any more updates on this. <laughs> No, no, I think Yuki uh, did a great job um, and uh, good to know that uh, now Japanese smokers are contributing to our <laughs> defense. Um, when we had a, like, a national poll last uh, July before the upper house election, uh, I think it was surprising to see that the 70% of Japanese responded that the, yes, we are uh, you know, uh, um, quite positive about the uh, increase of the defense budget. Um, and I think that was really uh, surprising to see that even the liberal newspaper had that similar result. But several months later, that uh, there's a different question: that do you want to support your, uh, the, you know, increase of the defense by increasing the tax rate? And the, the public said, no, "Oh no, no, no." <laughs> so the, these are uh, the interesting kind of democratic uh, kind of response on the support for the reinforcement of the uh, capability. And I was asked by the Ministry of Finance to offer my statement uh, in the Diet. Uh, how, how do I have to think about it? I'm, I'm not a specialist on, on the budget structure, but I think that the current Japanese plan, which Ayuki has eloquently uh, explained, is how to survive next five years uh, to, uh, you know, meeting the uh, 43 trillion Japanese yen, if I'm, I'm correct, to uh, to have a lots of patchworking of the, you know, reform on the expenditure and how to increase. Uh, the income uh, over it. But the whole structure of the Japanese fiscal um, uh, deficiency, I mean, in, in, a, in a, the terrible structure that we have on, on the fiscal system because of the Asian society uh, that we have remains to be the same. So we are looking at the 2032 in our strategy where we need to have a lots of like a plan to be uh, implemented. How we can really support the remaining five years or even more uh, and so, so lots of expenditure will be lined up. Uh, that is not have a responsible answer uh, towards it. So definitely that department uh, needs to work on how you can really sustain the longer term expenditure on the Japanese defense under very strained fiscal structure. Of course, that's the rub. You know, you've got to pay for the things that cost money. Um, <laughs> little do we know. Uh, Margaret, thank you for the question. Um, Zach, I'd like to ask you a question also from the audience, from Michael. Uh, he asks, Japan seems like an obvious candidate for military co-production to support capacity and stability. How likely do you think that is to come to fruition at scale? Well, I, I think you're right that it should be an obvious candidate, but I think we're actually doing less in this regard than we should be. Um, you know, the, the last major co-production project we had between U.S. and Japan was SM-3 Block 2A, which is a missile defense interceptor, uh, air defense interceptor. So um, that's a good example that we can cooperate, but anyone you ask about that program will say that it, it has been quite challenging. And we don't actually have another good example of a major co-production effort between the U.S. and Japan, a co-development effort. So I think you're right. We have a lot of similar needs and we operate a lot of similar uh, systems, but most of those are actually operated through the foreign military sales uh, avenue, which, which is different than real co-development and co-production. So I think this is an area where I'd like to see more U.S.-Japan cooperation, but I have to say the recent progress has been pretty minimal. Uh, I think both sides are to blame, maybe the U.S. more in, in some areas than others. So I'll give you one example, which is uh, Japan is developing a new fighter jet. Who is it developing that with? Well, it's not the United States. In fact, it is the United Kingdom and Italy. Uh, now, I, I love my Italian and British friends, but if you ask me, it would have made a lot more sense for the U.S. and Japan to try and cooperate on a next generation fighter because we're the ones facing the more advanced uh, threat from China. And, and so we have very similar needs. And the U.S. has a next generation fighter program that the Air Force is running. So if, if it were up to me, I would have said, let's try and include Japan into that program early on. Now, there are many challenges. We already have talked about some of them, right? Yuki and Ken were talking about uh, the difficulties of information security, which would be a problem. 
Uh, but at the end of the day, our requirements in many areas are very similar, right? This is why we both operate Aegis ships and F-35 Joint Strike Fighters and, and many others. So um, I think there's a lot more we can do here. Uh, the United States and Australia and the United Kingdom have done a major advanced uh, effort under both uh, Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 of the AUKUS arrangement. I think there's room for the U.S. and Japan to think about a major co-development program going forward, but it's, it's going to require a bit of a change in mindset, probably in both Washington and in Tokyo. Fantastic. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Michael, again for the question. Really appreciate it. Um, I see we only have about four minutes remaining. Um, so I, I hope to, to ask you each to kind of give maybe a minute in closing remarks. Um, but uh, Jake, if I could ask you uh, in your uh, final thoughts, um, just that, uh, so in writing this report, um, we were conscious of the balance between being comprehensive and being readable. Uh, and that inevitably means we can't cover everything. So um, in closing, is there any particular aspect of the Alliance or related matters that you would have included if we had had a bit more space in the report? Yeah, so there's just so much going on in this space right now. So, you know, this is one of the longer reports that that I've written during my time at CNAS. And in many areas, we still felt like we were just scratching the surface. So, you know, there, it's just such a rich area. But if I would expand uh, on some areas that, that we felt were kind of undercovered, I think on the threat per perceptions, I would have liked to examine more about how increased coordination among authoritarian powers, particularly China and Russia. North Korea has its own uh, elements, but particularly China and Russia affects the U.S.-Japan alliance. I think increasingly it seems that uh, the whole is kind of greater than the sum of its parts, even uh, after the, the Ukraine war and especially uh, for Japan itself. Uh, but there's more work to be done on kind of the specific contours of how that cooperation matters uh, and what are the best ways to respond, uh, both as an alliance, but but also in a more global sense. Um, you know, I think to, to Zach and others' points, uh, there's already been a lot of work done, but probably uh, would be useful to talk more about uh, alliance crisis management as a spectrum from uh, contingency planning all the way through uh, command and control uh, in a contingency or a conflict and, and really thinking about, uh, in particular, uh, you know, as uh, Japan has additional capabilities to respond uh, in a scenario where events might be moving really fast, um, you know, what should we be planning for and, and, and how are we thinking about that coming together, especially with something like North Korea where, uh, uh, or a Taiwan contingency where it could kind of happen uh, very briefly or, or very quickly. And then third and finally, I, I you know, it's it, in these reports, it's easy to kind of point out what's not going, you know, where the what needs work. Um, but I think there is a lot to be said about what's the tremendous progress that's already been made. Uh, I'll just point at a few areas. Joint exercises, I think, uh, the fact that many of the, sh the threat perceptions are shared. Uh, and I think it also a, a commitment, both at the political and operational level, to building a network security architecture in the region. Um, a, a lot of which, you know, was was uh, you know pushed from Tokyo, pushed from Washington in different periods as kind of the lead, but but really uh, has been quite cohesive. Um, and so there is a section on that uh, in the report, but it's it's really a section about all the the really impressive things that have been done. Um, so those are some areas I'd I'd probably cover more that that each kind of have their own story. Thank you. Um, Ken, uh, your final thoughts, please. Sure. Uh, definitely that uh, we are facing with uh, uh, enormous uh, challenges, both conceptual and also uh, operational. And I think that uh, we have uh, set up the very similar uh, types of the platform uh, in our, both of our national uh, strategies. And I think that the, now we are uh, getting down uh, into how we can really uh, uh, you know, combine uh, those uh, sets of uh, concepts uh, into uh, to the operations, and that involves you know how to create the deterrent structure, how to respond to the uh, the actual contingency, and how to terminate uh, those uh, situation. And those kind of dynamics, uh, I think that there will be a more uh, U.S. Japan coordination uh, will be needed. So we we have a lot of things to discuss about that. Absolutely, Yuki, over to you. 
Very quickly, thanks. Um, so on the uh, industrial ba industrial um, co-production issue, I think I just would like to uh, highlight the uh, recent agreement that uh, two government came out on the uh, gliding phase interceptor, or the Japan joining the uh, program. So I think I'd really like to see how that uh, goes. Um, but then on the other, um, um, on the uh, info infosec side, I think we may have a really good um, combination of uh, private sector finally coming into realizing the importance of those uh, in, uh, information security and industrial security, especially relating to its own supply chain resi resiliency and this uh, friends shoring uh, development that's coming. And that is re that has been really the key for uh, defense in you know, Japan, Japanese defense industry, which is usually the part of a big company, uh, like one department, a small department of it, to uh, bring the rest of the company along. So now that non-defense side of the same company is increasingly become aware that without them doing something on this, um, their business opportunity might be risk constrained. I think um, that could really uh, work for the uh, um, for us. And uh, it is also helpful that the Meti minister stayed and uh, he, I do know that he is very interested in this issue as well. So we may ha finally have the uh, moment where we can make a meaningful, meaningful progress on that one. Thank you. And uh, Zach, any saved rounds to close us out? Yeah, let me first just thank uh, you, Josh and Jake, for, for a great report and for having us all on this morning. It's really uh, been a fantastic discussion. Let me just highlight one thing which we haven't talked about much, which is Taiwan. Uh, we've been talking around it, but not about it specifically. And, and obviously neither of our countries have official relationships with Taiwan. But I think the reality is, as we talk about our defense postures and we talk about um, how we are planning together for contingencies, it is in increasingly clear that a Taiwan contingency is, is maybe the most likely of all. And so I think we're going to have to do what you all re recommend in the report, which is quietly think about how to be more directly coordinating with Taiwan in preparation for the possibility that there could be a contingency. It doesn't just have to be an invasion, it could be missile barrage or blockade or seizure of an outlying island, but we would have to respond to that as allies. And I think we'll have to quietly do more planning uh, both between the U.S. and Japan, but also sometimes involving authorities in Taiwan as well. But uh, thanks again. It's really been a, a wonderful discussion. Thank you for raising that very important topic. Um, you know, we, I feel like uh, we've already gone two minutes over, so I apologize about that. We could continue to discuss all these issues for another hour, I'm sure. Um, but uh, I'll have mercy on Ken, who is now uh, up at 2 a.m. in New Zealand. So um, thank you all for, for joining us this morning, for tuning in. Uh, special thanks to the panelists um, and everybody at CNAS on the comms team working things behind the scenes. Uh, and uh, hope you read the report. Thank you so much and have a great rest of the day. <laughs>